I'm Brad King, and this is Stories in Steel. On this episode of Stories in Steel, we talk with Hernan Deloya of Engrave It in Southern California's Rancho Cucamonga. We talk about his background with airbrushing, building bicycles, and art school, and how staying focused and on the gas keeps him at the top of his game. If you've ever been curious about this amazing art form, you're going to love this. Man, this is this is a little unique for me. I am I am a little out of my comfort zone. <laughs> I'm a gearhead all the way, and I and I've been around paint world. I've been around cars. I've been around. And I'm, I'm now trading in an area that I'm completely unfamiliar with, with, uh, with what you do for a living. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's quite amazing. And it's definitely an art form that I've admired, but I have no idea, you know, what goes on when, uh, when, when you do this stuff. So thank you for sitting down with me. No, I appreciate you even taking the time. Um, you know, it's... Like metal engraving is, it is kind of like a, a different thing. It's definitely not a street raw guy. It's not a, you know, a rockabilly rat rod kind of themed thing. It's not. So engraving could be for anything. Um, it could be from firearms to swords, knives. You know, the, the art of engraving comes from years ago. You know, it's not like it's not something I created, obviously. Um, it's uh, something I saw in firearms, even though I'm not a firearms guy, per se, but I saw it as it was cool. And then when I was building a lowrider bike way back when, um, Lowrider Magazine used to have uh, a category for engraving, just like they did for pinstriping, painting, all that, chrome. So it was like 10 points, I think it was, for like engraving on your lowrider bike. So it was like ornamental stuff, right? So um, that's how I got into it. Is so I I wanted to have engraving on my bike. Okay, so before that, I mean, this is a it's it's still a very artistic media. It's mm-hmm. not you know whether you're doing airbrush work or paint work or, right. or whatever. It's you know it's still a, it's still a, a type of fine art. You know because everything you you have you still have boundaries. You're trying to you know you got to color in the lines. Right. Let's let's look at you know the answer. <laughs> you're, you're coloring in the lines. Right. Right. So so were you were you artistic as a kid? Were so. You, um artistic as a kid like so my parents were immigrants from argentina so it was like they were just trying my dad was just trying to be you know bust his ass like you know he was working real hard mom was home um there was a lot of stuff we couldn't afford right so i would draw it i would draw it like i I like monster trucks a lot so i would start drawing um i also would draw you know like Believe it or not, like certain Nikes that I, my mom and dad couldn't afford to buy okay. and they wouldn't buy them. Um, I would draw that. And um, I, I was never really good at drawing um, realism as for say, um, like a face. So, but I'm really good. I know there's a word out there. I always get it confused, but like, I'm really good. I could duplicate something like I could you stuck with more, it's more like mechanical things than trying to do real yeah. life. That was more, so, more your thing. And then at 12, I bought my first airbrush with a newspaper route. Um, I bought an old Badger and I wanted to airbrush. I just wanted airbrush. And I saw my first Lowrider magazine around the time I was 12. I started my first car with hydraulics around the time I was 12. So I already took a, like a cool thing okay. for it. I liked it. Um, so it was like a mixture of emotions in my head of like, okay, what? But I also was doing art classes and stuff like that. But I was like, ah, oh, this is different. But the art classes didn't know anything about the airbrushing. So I, I grew up in the city of Whittier and there was a guy in Uptown Whittier. I don't remember the gentleman's name or the shop, the name at the time. But he had a little airbrush shop that did t-shirts. And I go in there, oh man, I want to learn. And he's like, well, I do little classes. But and then he gave me a price and I was like, yeah, I can't afford that. Like, and. And it was a mental thing. I probably could have if I would have just saved my money. And But uh, he's like, oh, look, buy this book. And it was like 20 bucks. It was like an airbrush book, how to do beach, like waves crashing and all that stuff. And I still have that book, believe it or not, at home. I started airbrushing, just getting white little sheets and airbrushing with my badger. And I'm like, man, this thing kind of sucks. And uh, one day I was telling my dad, I got to save up. I'm going to buy this other one, a, a Pache VL, like spread and tell my dad and my dad worked with a gentleman that he built model cars. And my dad was a mechanic at a Volvo dealer and this guy, Bruce, he was like, he's all, oh, 
no, Rocky, my dad's name was Rocky. He's like, he's like, you know, you, you know, they have they have these airbrush kits they sell if you want to get it for your son. Like, and I would always talk to Bruce because I was intrigued, like how he got all these little model cars. He would make them like on point, right? Paint and everything. And sometimes he would do funny cars and he would have all the stickers and the graphics all laid out cool. And I was like, damn, that's pretty badass. How's he doing that? Well, he was doing it with airbrush a lot. So my dad, I guess, must have talked to him and say, hey, you know what, his 13th birthday's coming up, he wants to do this. Like, So Bruce took him to some, some hobby store. I think it was a place in La Habra. And they they sold him a VL, you know. And um, at 13, I started airbrushing with that VL. So you got a VL for a present. Yeah. That's yeah. That's pretty awesome. Um, so I was airbrushing, I started airbrushing the, like, the beach scenes, the names, the letters, the the bubble letters also, and then sometimes to try to get girls' attention in school, and by that time I was in high school. Then sometimes I would do like beach towels, and like, or family members would come in from out of town, and I'd do something for them, and nothing got, not, wasn't overboard, but I would practice, and um, what I ended up doing is, uh, when I got into high school, I got involved with stuff I shouldn't be getting involved with, and my mom and dad were like, okay, cool you're gonna do that we're taking this away so it was like cool so and obviously you know i i don't mind saying it is i got wrapped up with, you know doing drugs it wasn't crazy hardcore i wasn't addicted nothing like that it was just they saw it and being immigrants they got really scared of that and they were just like no if and what it was it was is because i used something from the airbrush that <laughs> they they <laughs> saw and um, anyway, long story short, they took it I away. I shouldn't be laughing because I know what you were doing. Oh, so, exactly. Yeah. So it was like, I, 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 you know, I fast forward. I was like, you know what? It was probably better because I would always tell my dad, I'm like, I want to airbrush cars. I would always tell him the lower end magazines. And he wasn't a car customer by no means. He was just a regular mechanic. Um, he, he would work for Volvo. So he wasn't like. Like, oh, he's fixing up, like, Beijing engines. Like, oh, man, we have a low rider here that we're tricking out. Like, nothing like that. I didn't grow up with that. So I, I told him, man, I want to airbrush cars. I want to airbrush cars. I want to airbrush cars. So then I, I left the country for from the time I was 17 to 18. I tried to airbrush again, and I just wasn't. It was just, I think the, the lit had, the fire had unlit, and I was just, like, over it. And then uh, I started building a low rider bike. And being that the lowrider community is the majority of it was, um, you know, Mexican American, black, some white, you know, it just, it, I was an outcast technically because I'm I'm white, but I'm not Mexican. Right. I speak Spanish, but I'm not Mexican. <laughs> so it was like, Mexican. I'm like, okay, um, I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna name this bike Argentinian Pride, and because I'm proud to be from where I'm from. I love the U.S. I'm very proud to be here. And, and got raised here from the time I was five, but it's, that was my thing. I was like, well, there's Mexican pride, there's white pride, there's black pride, there's this, that, whatever you want to call it. Sure. Okay. I'm like, I'm from Argentina. I'm none of the above. So I'm just going to call it that. And I stuck with that. And I got airbrushing done by a gentleman on that bike called Eliza Carrillo back in the day. Uh, he was from Orange County. He was really well known, like doing a lot of airbrushing back in the day. On like, so you had somebody else do your airbrush work for you? Yeah, because at that time I didn't do no more airbrushing. Okay. So I was just wanting to build this lowrider bike. Did you Did you watch him or did you just no? Drop the he, stuff yeah, off? At that time I wasn't. I didn't know him that good enough to be like, hey, you know. Um, originally the bike was going to get airbrushed by somebody else, but they kind of blew me off. So I was just like, all right, pull it away, and and I gave it to Eliza. Eliza airbrushed it. And then um, Bugs LA, not Bugs Arizona, but Bugs LA, he did some patterns later on. And then Danny D did some striping for me later on on the bike. Okay. It was, as I progressed on the bike, I started doing that. And um, I had somebody else do some engraving on it, but it was with like a rotary dental tool. And I, I was like, no, I want I want something deeper. Could I always see the engraving magazines, and, and, and not magazines, and, um, and gun pamphlets, right? for like Smith & Wesson, I think it was Colt, and I don't remember one other company, but they offered it. If you would take your gun, they would like submit it and then you could do it. And I was like, man. And there was only one other guy that was really doing engraving 
um, based out of Colorado. It was a shop called Robert's Tire and Wheel. They would offer engraving for some of the lowrider cars and some of the bicycles. And I was like, man, that engraving is what I want it to look like. So then I, I started competing with a bike. I noticed that I'm like, the judge were like, oh, you need to get the cut and buffed. Oh, you need to do this. You need, I was like, okay. And I was a little older. So most guys were building cars. I was already 18 already. So I was like, I was like this is just my little hobby. I'm going to build this bike for me right now. I was going to school full time, um, like ITT and passing in art center design. I was going there for a little bit too. So it was like, it was, I had work full time, school full time. And then I really guy. couldn't afford busy to build guy. a car at the time. Really busy. Or maybe guy. I could have, if I would have saved my money, like I always say, but I chose the bike. So anyhow, all these judges would tell me as I started competing, and they're like, hey, you need this, you need that. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I was like, oh man, I'm gonna add more engraving. So I had this gentleman, Dave, David Renteria, he did some rotary engraving, but it was a little lighter. I know David still to this day, great guy. Um, he's still doing engraving as well, but it was just not what I wanted. So I was just like, oh, I'm gonna start doing mine. I bought a couple different machines and tried to do it myself. And cause he had quoted me on some wheels and I was like, I really can't afford to do the wheels on the bike. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna do this myself. Yeah, I'm gonna try it. And I, I started messing around with like electric engraver from like Craftman or whatever. And then um, I was like, my dad had a, a air tool that was like an air scribe. And I was like, oh, this goes deeper. And but I was like, still doesn't look right. And I was like, man, I'm gonna start going to the library because this is way before YouTube and all this other stuff, right? So I went to the library and I started researching engraving. Well, when you research engraving, a lot of stuff's gonna come up, you know, from when they did hammer and chisel onto stone. Okay. Okay. That covers, so, so it covers a huge area. Oh, a engraving's area. crazy. It's not just, engraving's crazy. It's not just metal. There's wood carvers, that's engraving. Okay, everybody's gonna word it different, but it's still engraving. The saddle guys doing leather, all that. All that, that's all still, that I mean, it's not considered, it's leather working at the, that time, but all that, it's kind of like in its own group, but it's got its own different entities, right? Okay. And so I started researching, I'm like, okay, well, I know the guns I've been engraving, I'm gonna research. So I got one guy that he was like, I finally, I finally called, I don't remember what gun company it was, and I'm like, you guys offer engraving where who teaches or where can i get this equipment and the company they had one guy i don't remember what company it was somebody told me about a company so I, I started researching it and at the same time i had a, a friend of mine that was from like the same lowrider bike club but they were from northern california and their neighbor was a metal engraver guy so i was like the kind well, of stuff you like yeah the, stuff the you kind like, of stuff okay. i like so i was right. like dude i need to get that and he says well let me talk to him. Well, the man got sick and he ended up passing away before I was even, he was even doing classes. His name was Ben Oweno. And um, I think that's how you pronounce his name, his first and last name. And so, and, and like I said, lowrider engraving wasn't common. It wasn't what it is now. You're, you're talking about, this is in 1996, 97. So, so I finally got around to finding out this company itself. And um, I'm not going to name drop the brand, none, but I still use the equipment to this day. Okay. I still have my original machine till this day. I teach classes with that equipment, not the not the equipment I use, but the newer version of my equipment in this. So day. those were your people, the people that came yeah. up with this, that actually works so really well. For I you. found it. Um, I, I ended up ordering all this stuff. I didn't have the money to order it because it was about, about over three thousand dollars worth of equipment and this is in 1998 to give you an idea okay so equivalent right now you're going to buy the same amount of equipment for about five grand okay so when people hit me up and on instagram I'm like man what do you use i'm using the hair from home depot blah, blah, blah. like trust me dude you're like far off it's like somebody going to you and saying like hey or well, i've been striping paint and you're like okay well how, how far do you want to do leaving you? That's going to cost this one. They're going to do this, do that. Like it's, this is equipment. It's very good equipment. Okay. And so anyway, so I order all this stuff. I, I 
I well, I checked prices on all the stuff first when I finally locked it down, and uh, I I couldn't afford it. I was going to school full time, working full time, to pay for the school, and and pay for this little side hobby thing. There's no so extra like, three thousand dollars laying around. Yeah, and I'm like, and and I wasn't a good saver to be honest with you. So I was just like, okay. And I like to emphasize that too, because especially when I get interviewed, because save your money, everybody, save your money, you know, <laughs> patience and money, patience and money, you know, because in reality, I wasn't taught that, you know. Um, so I, so I, at the time, I had a friend. She's like, hey, you know. I have a credit card that has five thousand dollar limit. Like you could use it, you pay me back. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, nah, I can't do that. You know, like, no, no, no. A month and a half later, I folded. I was like, hey, can can I can I buy it? I'll pay you back. And he's like, you got to pay me back five hundred dollars every month. And da-da. so, anyhow, so uh, I I order it all. I start paying her what I can, you know, and back get it all paid off. But it took me about a year of hitting my head against the wall how to sharpen the chisel right, how to do all that, to lock it down. Because there was videos, but they were on VHS. I didn't have a VHS player at the time, <laughs> besides my mom's living room or dad's living room, right? I didn't have my own workbench, so my pops would work on cars part-time at home. So he had this workbench, um, and and he would come home from work, from working as a mechanic, and work cars on cars part-time at home. So I'd have to wait until he was done to set up my engraving equipment to try to practice. So that was probably nine or 10 o'clock at night and then till 12 or one. And then the next day, wake up at six or seven to get to work on time. Do it all over so again. So do it all over again, right? So I was just like, all right, cool. Some days was cool because I would go to college or, or my trade school like at night. So when I got home, pops was done. So I'd get to be able to practice, right? So I practiced for about a year watching this little sharpening video which is like, it's cool when you start, but I'm like, uh, this is still not coming out. I'm like, man, how do these guys do it? Like, and I didn't know nobody that taught. And I was like, at that time, the where I bought the equipment, they offered classes. But on, unfortunately, I just, they offer classes Monday through Friday and it's in the Midwest. And it was just like, it, it was not feasible. As it is barely the, the equipment was feasible for me. So I, I started just practicing in my head against the wall, just with different things. And uh, about a year into it, I what I did, because I was like, how do I get my name out there? How do I let people know that I'm doing this? Now I'm a little more confident. I, I started engraving. It looks it looks like a decent scroll, or I thought it was a decent scroll. If I look at it now, I'm like, oh my gosh, what the heck was I doing? <laughs> but Because I was engraving lowrider bikes for some people, but it was with an air scribe. And that air scribe, it just the lines were like jaggedy they weren't lying it was just not right so i practiced for about a year i get somebody that i knew to mold upper control arm or upper a arm right of a car which is real common in the lowrider stuff they mold them tap cap them off and and nobody was really doing too much engraving but there was a few guys like i said that guy from robert's tire and wheel in colorado he and, was, and there's a lot of flat area on those upper on those. Oh, areas. big Once you time. fill that up, Heck, it's, yeah. it's a it's a canvas. Oh there's, yeah, it's a big canvas. It's a big it's canvas. Decent. So what I did, I noticed that guy Robert Tyron Wheel. At that time, I didn't know he used a gentleman named Jeremy Potts to do all the engraving, and Jeremy Potts is still around, and and I've never met Jeremy, but his work is awesome, awesome work, and that's who I admired to be like, hey, I need to cut like him or better, cut like him or better. And I don't know if that's ever been the case with you. Like, like you see somebody else drive and you're like, well, well that, I, I want to be better than that. You have to be. That's, yeah. That has to be so, your goal. Yes. So, and at that time, I didn't know nothing about goal setting, this, that. I was just like, let's just make this happen, you know? And um, so I ended up getting this guy that I knew to mold this control arm. Got it stripped and polished. And then I started engraving it and I got it chrome and gold plated. So some of the stuff that you've seen here at the shop that's two-tone chrome and gold, um, I figured, you know what, that'd be kind of cool. So by this time, when I, by the time I did that A-arm, I already worked at a job that I already graduated school. I worked at another job full time. I was a head drafter at, at, for doing shop drawings, for installation drawings for an acoustical wall company and that did big studio stuff. So it was a cool job. I liked my job, you know, and I was, 
sometimes you're like you look back and you're like full paid benefits profit sharing all this stuff all the cool stuff that I, sometimes i wish i had nowadays right and so uh, at that place we had these big old printers so i i made some you know through autocad i kind of created some looking business cards and i printed them and we had these big cutters and i i printed them in thicker paper and i cut them and i printed like i don't know about 40 50 cards something like that and I would go to these car shows and I'd go with a control arm walking, walk the car shows, just chrome and gold plated engraved, and I had some business cards in my back pocket. And I would walk around and when people would stop me, they're like, hey, who did that? I did, here you go, boom. Oh, pretty smart, man. I gotta so give you that. I, I didn't know if it was smart at the time. No, that was, <laughs> was, like, was a good thing to carry a little heavy, a you know, little awkward to oh, drive yeah, around the whole but day. But I had tried it. to do it, with, I had tried to do that on, on a low rider custom fen- a low rider bicycle custom uh, f- uh, fork brace, but it wasn't the engraving was different, and it was the air scribe, and it wasn't too eye catching. Control arm. Now I got bike guys looking at it because it's chrome and gold. Motorcycle guys well, looking at it big. and car guys. It's yeah, big so you can so see it. It was a pain in the butt carrying that uh. thing around. But I was like, when they would ask me, I'd be like, here, until I ran out of cards. And then I would have to give them my number. And then I'm like, hey, you know, oh, man, cool, cool. And that control arm, it, at that time, there was a, this is like in already late 90s, like so 99-ish. 90, yeah. Um, so 99, early 2000, right before 2000, I think. And there was a, a, a forum called layitlow.com, which was like a lowrider forum. And so I started uploading pictures on there. And I always had a digital camera, you know? And I bought a digital camera for like 1200 bucks. It was like one more, 1.2 megapixel camera or something. I was taking pictures all the damn time, you know? And uh, document everything. And before the cameras, I was taking regular pictures and developing them. So I have a shitload of like printed pictures. Yeah, pictures. Yeah, I got pictures. And and um, so what I did for the web, so, so within all this, I don't know, it was called marketing at the time. I had no idea what marketing was until about maybe eight, nine years ago. I didn't know nothing about that. I need a website. And then I'm gonna post pictures on that, lay it low. So I, I don't want people taking my pictures. So I'm like, I gotta water stamp them. I gotta look into this. So I had, I uploaded a program, I got a website and at that website, back then the websites, most people don't realize is you paid the website or the hosting company for so many hits per month. After that, your website froze. So like, I paid extra. Sometimes I would max out my five hundred dollar little credit card that I had. Like, like oh man, I got a, I got more hits on it, you know. But what I did, I also to attract more people to the website to let them know more about me is um, what I also did was added a section of car shows, right? So I didn't care if you did work with me or not, or if I didn't even know you. I took a picture of your car and posted up, and be like, especially if you hit me up and you're like, hey, let me check out that arm. Who did it? Oh, here's my card. Hey, you know what? Is that your car? Yeah. Oh, I just take pictures, man. I'm, it's going to be up on the website. Come and check it out. So I would attract people to come check out the website. And now then at the same time, I was already part of Lalo. So it was like double, double the ante, you know, because now you could check out the car show pictures on my website or you could check out my engraving on the website or the Lalo. So both I was kind of going nice back and forth. Nice marketing move. This is, so, this is good. I, you know, I, I don't know what the hell I was doing. I just, it, it worked out. It just worked out. And then I started traveling to different car shows all around the country of doing different things. Um, that control arm, one dude hits me up from New York and he says, hey, can you send it to me? And I was like, uh, no, man, no. like I can't send this thing. He kept bugging and bugging. He's like, look, dude, I'll pay for it. And I remember how I came about. Somehow he convinced me to send it. So I'm at my regular job. I pack it up through UPS, send it out to New York. He's like, dude, I need to show my car club member guys. Dude, we're we're from Drastic Auto Club, blah, blah, blah. We have this, we're having a meeting this weekend. Blah, blah. I'm like, I'm, I knew who they were. I was like, oh shit, they're pretty big out on the East Coast. Cool, man, screw it. Why, why not tackle somewhere else besides just California? Sure. So I, I sent it to him. <laughs> Crossing my fingers, I'm gonna get this A arm back. So like not even a week later after the arm gets there back, I get a call from a guy in Washington. 
He's like, hey, man, I'm looking for engraving, blah, blah, blah. I was going to get this other guys to do it, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, uh, my, my painter, man, Sal Manzano, told me about his arm that he saw. And can you do these hydraulic pumps? I'm like, yeah, I can do them. Yeah, that's not a problem. First time I ever, I had done some car engraving, but it wasn't like, oh yeah, you're me- now you're really messing with somebody's budget, you know? Like, he had this tricked out like Honda Prelude, like done lowrider style, and then he's like, hey, I want these four hydraulic pumps done, blah blah blah, and I was like, all right, cool man. So I want to want some other little stuff done. If this comes out good, and I trust you, I'm gonna send it, man. I, I don't know who you are, but Sal said you're the Sal had never met me. But Sal liked your work. Yeah, and Sal sent it to me, so I'm very blessed. Um, <laughs> sorry. I I know Sal's going through some things right now, too, and I feel really bad. Um, you know, he's getting older, and he's doing, you know, he has some other complications right now. And uh, ho- hopefully he gets better. But uh, I think I'm, I'm grateful. I'm really grateful. For a guy that you never met to go, never met. you got to, you got to, so have you ever, have you ever met him? Oh, before? yeah, yeah, okay. no, we became okay. real good friends. We've okay, even gone good. to concerts together, stuff oh, like okay, that, good. back in the day, and, and, um, real good guy, and, um, so I do this job for this guy, <laughs> told him, yeah, I can do it, never done hydraulic parts before, <laughs> so I do these parts, get them chrome and gold plated here in Southern California for him, send it back to him, so man, I'm going to be busting my car out, I'm going to go, uh, Qualify my car for Lowrider Magazine, you know, at Portland, Oregon. They have a show, you know. Well, okay, cool. It's like, like I said, like 2000. And uh, I said, dude, I'll fly out there. So he wins like first place at that show for that class, whatever. I I come back and I literally get two customers right away from that show. And another big thing was, so he was competing for a thing called Lowrider uh, Euro, which is like import cars or like done a low rider style whatever and then but these guys had their car on exhibit which was a low rider bomb of the year right it was an old 50 style bomb and um the car was called pura vida pure life in english and so they they were on tour with low rider getting their car because they had just won the title the year before they're on exhibit at that portland show and i used to see them at the plating shop all the time but i didn't know who they were because they were like big at that time they were like heavy hitters like so um one of them comes up hey man we know who you are they're like oh so because they go up to the owner of the car like hey who did the engraving the chrome and gold and all oh this guy right here hey we know who you are you're that guy yeah we see you at the plating shop with the lowrider bike stuff all the time they knew me as that guy and i was like yeah that's me we didn't know you did engraving like this bro we're getting ready to redo the car we have engraving already, but we want to redo all this stuff. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And see, this is good because now they now they know you hands on. They, you know, that's Chrome Shop. They're yeah. looking at what you're bringing in. Right. They. Oh. What is this? Oh, yeah. You know, they're checking you out. So, yeah, it was it was cool. Just call it. I don't ever think it's a coincidence. You were meant to be there. You know what I mean? Sure. So it's like, and I was meant to be there at that time. Just like I was meant to mess up a lot of things in my life. <laughs> like, but I was meant to be there at that Oregon show. So they come back, we redo, you know, they redo their car, we do it. And like a two month stretch, I'm engraving day and night. Now I had a regular job and a good paying job. So I couldn't be like, hey, this fart around stuff. Like, so I did their bomb and they come out and they win the Lowrider magazine title again. So I do this bomb, I come back, maybe, I don't know, six months, whatever, year later, I get a call from these guys that owned a hydraulic shop out of San Fernando Valley and CNL Customs. And um, one of the brothers calls me and he says, hey, dude, we're redoing our car. You know, we had some engraving done. We're, we're not caring for it. We saw what you did on the on the bomb and we, we want you to do it. Can you quote us to do this transmission casing? You know, so, well, I'm the first one to ever do a transmission casing. These guys hit me up and I'm like, yeah, you know what? I work a regular job, so I have to go after her. So I lived in Whittier and I lit, I worked in Rancho Dominguez by Compton to give you an idea. So that's a, that's a hoof, that's a hoof, right? So, so from there, I had to go to San Fernando Valley to where their shop was at. And I said, I could be there around six or whatnot. 
Now, let me pause that a little You're bit. You're making a big loop here. Yeah. So that's nothing. Because let me pause this other part where people say like, oh, man, oh, how hard is it to do what you do? I was like, man, I, I did what most people didn't do back then. Wouldn't do. You know, you want to be good at something, do what others won't. So going fast forward to the other story, this guy, they're like, hey, we want you to do our car. We saw this other car. So now they're going for lowrider car of the year, not lowrider bomb of the year. So like the old cars, like the older fleet lines, all that, they got that category. And lowrider car of the year would be like, you know, Cadillacs, Monte Carlos, Impalas, all that kind of combined. And so I jammed my butt over there in San Fernando one day. I get there and the guys are like, look, man, our car is called Mexican Pride. Orgullo Mexicano in Spanish. That's what their actual car's name. And I was like, cool, all right. And like, I'm from Argentina. And one of the part, one of these guys that I knew from like lowrider bikes, he happened to be there. I knew another friend of mine. He wasn't a bike guy, but he happened to know. He's like, hey, I know this dude. You know, he speaks Spanish. He looks like a white boy, but he speaks Spanish, whatever, right? And then, uh, yeah, right? <laughs> the big thing, you know? I'm like, and uh, and uh, they're all, oh, yeah, so where are you from? I'm from Argentina. Oh, cool well look man no disrespect against all the stuff that you do all the filigree all that whatever it's called so we're we're, we're mexican dude we don't want any of that we want all aztec shit it's like oh yeah all right yeah i was like well, i'm gonna have to charge a little more because it's a little more artwork you know a little more oh well okay so, well look we have this you know transmission housing that we want done i was like okay it's already stripped and polished. We're gonna take care of the plating. Don't worry about that. And we have these other parts done later. But we want us to test you on this. You're gonna test me out of all things on a transmission case. At least it's soft. Was yeah, it gonna oh, be yeah. it wasn't so gonna be hard? It's cast like aluminum, yeah, so you're it's cool. It's gonna be easy on your So plates. he's like, I'm all right, so it's this price, I told him. And he's all, but look, don't even put none of that scroll stuff on there. We don't want none of that scroll crap. We want all Aztec stuff. All right, the car's called Mexican Pride, so we're going to go to Ancestry of the Aztecs and all that. Like, Makes sense, right? Sure. It's cool. And I'm like, cool, this is perfect because now I can show people I don't do just the filigree stuff. And I've always tried to have my own design. I don't like copying traditional engraving. So I'm, I'm the outcast of engraving world because of that. So yeah, I could do it. I could do it. Never done Aztec stuff in my life. <laughs> never airbrushed and drawing. Never drew nothing. So guess what I did? Go get my ass back to the library. Look up Aztec. Go get Aztec book. Go get this. Go get that. So I was like, all right, cool. So I got home that same night. So I didn't get home from the valley back to Whittier until maybe let's say nine o'clock. So you're taking a library trip in there. You're yeah, already gone to the library, I, dude. I because they, you know, all that stuff. It was the next day. The next day on my lunch break, that's what I did. I went lunch break the next day. I went in the library, got all these books. Right. So I'm like, okay, what can I put on this thing? What can I put on the bell housing? What can I? And I wasn't crazy amount of engraving. Like I said, back then they didn't flood the engraving so much. It was more like little accents of it, right? So I was like, all right, man, man, I'm going to do the center part of the Aztec calendar probably on the bell housing. I'm going to add some other stuff here. Maybe do some what I call the Aztec tribals that look like, you know, it's kind of more like squarish, like. Um, like I don't know the right wordage for it, but so anyway, I, I laid it all out the next day. I was on a mission, so the first day came back. The next day went on my lunch break, got all paperwork. That same night when I got home after work, I laid it out. I did, and I I was fortunate that my mom had a photocopy machine at home, like a full size, so I could enlarge and shrink stuff. Make your patterns. Yeah, I made my patterns, all that. Boo boo, laid it all out with paper, transferred it all over, had it all done. The next day I came home from work and I literally like, I went in early on purpose to work so I could leave early. And I came back and I busted ass engraving it like until one in the morning. Friday morning, I was like, I called up the polisher. I said, hey, I'm gonna drop something off for you. All right, you need to polish over all the engraving to take out the metal burrs, if there's any. I drop it off so I go from Whittier, that's Friday morning, to Almani, drop it off, say, hey, I need you to polish this up. I'm gonna be back for this shit at lunch. You're on a mission. Yeah, so I go to work. I still get to work half an hour early. <laughs> on my lunch, since I had half an hour, I told my manager, I was like, and my supervisor, I was like, hey dude, look, I gotta go pick this thing up in Omani, but I'm just gonna eat my lunch in the car. I'm gonna jam and I'll be back before the hour and a half. I was like, call the guys and I'm like, hey, it's done. It's already done. I'm gonna take it to you after work. 
better have some money. <laughs> yeah, kind of like with that attitude, like, yeah. And I'm like, jam over there. So I jam back to work, finish my day, jam my ass back over there to the valley on a Friday from like Rancho uh, Dominguez or Compton, whatever, right? And so I give it to him like, man, oh well, man, we have all these hydraulic parts now, we have this, add two chains a little Now you bit. just proved yourself. Oh now yeah, you're done. Now, now it's done. We need to bring you. And then they, they ended up going for the title for Loretta Car of the Year. They didn't get this, they got disqualified because something with the car wasn't functioning right. But 2003 is the first year I went in and become self-employed. So the owner of that car, he's like, hey, look, I got a sponsor that's paying me, you know, to go here, 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 here. He's like, uh, you're self-employed now. If you want, you could come hit the road with me. You just have to bring your own money. But I got I got the place, this, that. I was like, Psh, cool. So I got to travel. I got to travel like more or less helping him just set up his car. So we showed and you're that at the car. good car shows now. Now you're oh at yeah, the now I was at the big car, car shows. Yes. So we we were going to we went to shoot one time we were gone for like three weeks in a row because we did back to back lowrider magazine shows that were qualifiers. Long story short, I, I got to travel a lot, you know, and I took advantage because I didn't have kids, I didn't have a wife, I, didn't, I was single. Oh shit, I was living at home with my mom and dad, you know. So it's like I didn't need that much money to survive. So you know? so. Mm -hmm. Now, now you get your foot in the door. Right. I'm, I'm going to assume now that you're dealing with the lowrider, lowrider car show magazine car shows. Yeah. I, I'm assuming you got you got tied in with cars that got a lot of magazine. Yes. Coverage. Yes. Okay, because that's going to be that's going to be great advertising for you. Because yeah. At the now time, it was has great. To look at it, so. mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had gone. Lowrider magazine used to have a little subsidiary magazine called Lowrider Bicycle Magazine, and I had guys that came out on the cover and the centerfold of that magazine already. But that was with what I call the chicken scratch engraving. So it was like not correct. And then when I started doing the, the carving engraving, and I always have a hashtag that I use, no chicken scratch. One day I'm I'm traveling with that car, that, that Orgullo Mexicano car, and I'm going for event to event. And my partners, there was an event, I think in Fontana or Irwindale, something. And we, we got paid to go somewhere else, right? So, and with a car to exhibit somewhere else. And the... Uh, or his sponsor wanted him to have the car somewhere else, whatever. And then like, my partners called me up that they would always go to car shows with me. And one of them calls me, he's like, bro, dude, we saw some, some engraving, bro, oh my gosh. And they're like, dude, this thing looked like chicken scratch. My buddy Frankie, he's like, this thing looked like chicken scratch, bro. It looked like you were in a coma and we grabbed the engraver in your hand and tried to engrave. <laughs> I was like, no, that's wrong, dude. Just laugh, but laughing because it was funny, right? I'm like, no, man, like this is wrong. But I'm like, it's funny, but I'm like, no chicken scratch. Oh, that just sounds that's good. Funny. I cool. like that. So when I started Instagram, I think it was like, this is fast forty many years later, I would always use that. No chicken scratch, no chicken scratch. And it was always on my shirts, so, like as a hashtag. I do feel like I'm still learning. I'm self-taught, but... And I teach classes and that, and people are like, well, who gives you the right to teach classes if you're so tired? Well, I'm going to teach you where not to F up, man. Okay, um, what does self-taught have to do with teaching? Well, class? I don't know. I don't know. But somebody asked me that a while, like, years ago, and huh. and I was just like, I don't know. I just want to teach people what I experienced in an introduction class to to eliminate some headaches. I don't want you to spend the money ruining stuff that I spent. Oh, my huge. class is gonna be cheaper than what it costs oh, big me time. to oh, ruin all huge, the crap I've you ruined over huge, the years. Huge, huge, man. Sure. I look at stuff that I've did, and some customer may be like, really, man, you're gonna say that out loud? Like, I look at stuff that I've done eight years ago, seven years ago, and I'm like, man, I could have done this a little different. How did you get into teaching? I mean, what, what brought, <sighs> shoot, man. What brought that on? So, you're hiring your own assassin, basically. Right. Yeah, it is and it's not. Um, there's work for everybody. So as long as you get your mindset, that is work for everybody. My work since teaching has quadrupled since starting to teach. So, and that kind of don't make sense, right? Unless so, unless, you're, unless your students are screwing up stuff and they have you. <laughs> so, no, not necessarily. Um, what I mean by that, now there's room for everybody. I've been doing my engraving for like, 24 years and some change almost 25 i 
I hate to say this out loud, but I only started taking this serious in the last seven years. And it's reflected. And when I started taking it serious, it wasn't because I had kids. It wasn't because I was married. It wasn't because of the, it had nothing to do with any of that. It had to do with something snapped inside me that said, hey, dummy, you've been doing this for years. You've been, you came out of magazine. You got top notch cars under your belt. You did this, you did that. You did commercial, you did TV shows. Like, okay, so what's next in growing? Well, is in growing is getting around other people to become mentors of yours. And I'm not necessarily talking about mentors in, in like hand engraving. I started getting mentors in like that I saw that were guys that I looked up to, whether there be airbrush guys and just, or, or what I call mentoring from a distance. You could, you could watch somebody on YouTube nowadays and you're just like, man, look at, look at how he does business. Look at how he's doing that. Man, look at his hustle. There's a few people, families even, that I've seen growing through the industry that I'm like, man, dude, their work ethic is awesome. I need to have that. My seriousness to this started when I first bought my first laser engraving machine. My machine payment was almost $1,100 a month. My shop rent at the time, I've only had a shop for 10 years. So the rest of the time I worked at home. My, my shop rent, I think, was like 700 bucks a month in Ontario. <laughs> so kind of give you an idea. How right. stupid is that? Yeah. Your machine is 1100 almost a month. You know? Almost double what your rent yeah. is. And then, uh, right now, you know, but whatever. Now we have three machines going on number four pretty soon. Wow. You know? So it's like, and we do laser engraving for all types of things. We're here now, but it's still hard. You know, you can't let go of the gas. And that's what I was doing my whole time. I would press the gas real hard and get where I want to be and let it go. And then what's the car gonna do? Stop. So I was doing that. So I know that's my fault. So I was like, I, I started asking for business advice, just for art advice, everything. And I got myself around some other people that I'm very, very grateful for their time. I had one gentleman that I, I asked him for 30, 40 minutes of his time. He gave me three and a half hours. Wow. You know what I mean? And this is a guy that he's he's been to the gutter and back up, you know? And, and I, I told a lot of people, man, I know what it's like. I might've mentioned this to you, to you on the phone the first time we talked is that is, you know, I know what it's like. <laughs> I know what it's like to have negative eight dollars and six cents in your account, and in the same year, you had one hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars in your bank account. I know what it's like. I'm not proud of that, but I know what not to do <laughs> anymore. Right? So, as long as you learn. So, uh, do you have any? Do you have any goals that you're aiming for now? I yeah. Mean, so, what what is your what is your goal? What is your next goal? There's going to be sooner or later, and I know a lot of my guys that took some classes or some classes that I'm going to do advanced classes. Um, I kind of stopped. I was originally when I first in, in, started doing engraving classes. The The whole method was going to be was going to be two engraving classes. I mean, an introduction, right? If you like it and you go along with it, you start practicing on your own. Um, then I'll do more in advanced, right? to do things that most people won't really mess with for a while. Um, but I stopped. That's my goal is to keep getting in different industries. You know, I don't want to stay, uh, I've done, I don't want to get out of low riders, but I know there's plenty of industries to get into, you know, and that's where I'm at right now. So my laser engraving part that the plan is to keep growing that goal. One of the major goals. And then, to keep getting in different industries and keep doing work for different level. There's a different level of everything, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Sure. And some people are like, oh, look at him. He's just trying to get the bigger dogs. Like, well, isn't that the goal? That's the goal. Isn't that the goal? You know, that like you're trying to get it. It's, it's not about me having bigger and better. It's about me doing work for bigger and better. Have they done cool stuff? And I'm gonna keep doing cool stuff. And we have more cool stuff lined up. 
oh, dude, I wish I could show Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, all this damn apps. I wish I could show everybody my YouTube channel. Like, I wish I could show everybody the cool stuff we do sometimes. But I can't because it's like a private thing and either it's collaborated with another artist and it's part of their thing. Man, like the car, for example, that car, Guy Mexicano, the Mexican Pride car, that car has been, and I always, everybody kills me on the artist world, it's gonna kill me. It's been, it's the only car that's ever been inside the Louvre Museum in France. Wow. So I have the authority to say my work Dude, bravo. So it's been in there. And I never used to say that out loud. And one of my mentors forced me to start telling everybody. You need to start letting everybody know. Absolutely. And it sucked because that car didn't get the recognition from Loretta Magazine or other people to say, dude, this is not only the only car to ever be on display underneath the glass pyramid. Okay. I've never been to this spot. But that's I want to. I want to go to this. But spot. that's where the Mona Lisa's at, man. Come on. Bernard, thank you very no, much. Thank sir. you, man. Thank you, sir. Very much. Appreciate man. you.